Welcome to another episode of A Beer with Atlas. I'm Rich. I'm Brian. Mike Combs. And Mike is with us today because we're going to do probably one of my favorite breweries in all of Colorado, Avery Brewing Company. Um, they have a barrel-aged, this is a stout, and it normally wouldn't be my jam at all, but, uh, oh, there we go. Mike doesn't turn his phone off when he comes. He's got to business it. to attend to. He does, he does have business to attend business. to. business. Yeah, there we go. You need to get that? You want to you wanna get that? No? You get it? Okay, all right. So Avery has done a, a ton of barrel aged over the years. Um, I just recently had this one at their tap room. It is amazing. The Avery Barrel Aged Raspberry Truffale. Is that how you pronounce it? Truffale? I'm going to let you go with that. Okay. Truffale? Truffale. T-R-U-F-F-A-L-E. I was going to say Truffale. Truffale? Yeah. Truffale? Yeah. I'm just doing what... I'm just following Steve's lead here. He's the one that ordered it when we were there. So Let's go with that. Go with uh, Trafale. Sure. Okay. Whatever. Either way, it's delicious, and uh, we're going we're gonna to try some of it right now. So, All right. Let's see. It's got this, this gold. Yeah, you got to get through the foil. got to get through the foil first. Look, it's all fancy with the foil and whatnot. Oh, all right. It's like glued on there. Hmm. All right. So as I'm pouring this, Brian, why don't you... Now, it's a stout, so I've learned, right? It's going to warm up a little bit. Yep. Right? And I have noticed, when I drank it there, I noticed that it was considerably different after it warmed up a bit. Okay. So what, what kind of knowledge do you have for us about... Well, just on that one, I looked up... I just looked at a big shot of the label itself mm -hmm. today. So on the label, it tells us exactly what temperature is optimal for this beer, which they say is 45 to 55. Mm-hmm. Um, that beer specifically, they made 400 or 1400 cases of it. So I think there's 12 or 16 in a case because they're those, those, uh, single style bottles mm -hmm. and it was bottled. All of it, the run was bottled on six eleven. Oh so geez. Okay. There's not a lot of this around anymore. No. And if you like this one, I would suggest going to buy some more cause it will soon be gone. Mm -hmm. If it is not, um, you said this was the 50th. Of the series, right? Yeah, that's barrel what it series. says on the label, yeah. Number 50 in our barrel age series. So I went back through my personal history of of uh, of these, of these beers, the Avery Barrel Series ones. Mm -hmm. I've had 11 of the 50, so I feel like that's, that's, pretty solid. that's respectable, right? Yeah, that's, that's pretty solid. The first one of them, I could trace it all the way back to November 16th, 2012. That was the first one. It was the Rumpkin. Oh, had that one, one yeah. Of those mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the first one of these I had. So we're almost six years to the day. Wow. Okay. Question. Yes. Did you? Uh, did anybody see how well this ages? Can you age this for a couple of years, a year? Does it bottle condition? I I assume it so, does because when I was there, they were selling all the way back to 2016 bottles there in the tap house. They were expensive, though. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're paying for that age. Absolutely. Especially at Avery. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, do they age in the bottle, or do they just sit and hold so you can store them for long periods of time? You know, an IPA expires in mm -hmm. no, short periods. No, I think period. this is, this is going to age in the bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how it ages, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, does it turn more into a barley wine after a couple of years? or? True. There's only one way to know. Yeah. You give it Buy a shot. a couple and hold on to them. And try it. I'd agree with that. Yeah. All right, I'm going to give it a shot here. And I remember this, so we'll see if it's different coming out of the bottle. Mm -mm. No, that's not different at all. That's delicious. Very raspberry smelling, for sure. Oh, so the smell on it, you definitely get that stout right up front, and then you get that raspberry to follow. It tastes like it tastes like Christmas candy. Like There's no other way to, to describe that. That's like raspberry when you get the box from your grandma of the Christmas candies, right? Yeah, uh -huh. or something. Yep, yep. And there's no, uh, nobody wants to eat the raspberry one. I will eat the raspberry one because it's my favorite. And it, that is exactly what that tastes like. Yeah, all day, every day. I yes. mean, just for recent comparison, it really starts out like a CBS, a KBS. I just put two of those side by side with the CBS release coming out recently. But that finish is incredible. How you get that, just that candy taste mm -hmm. after. What's the uh, what's the residue in here? What do, we, what do we get on the glass? What is this? 
Have you noticed that? Yeah, I got a little bit sitting up here towards little, the top. Little bits. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? I bet it's bits of raspberry, probably bits Could of... be of the puree, puree maybe. Or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe some of the oak off the barrel. A little mm -hmm. bit of the mash come through. Maybe. I don't know. I got a lot of it, though. And that's it's that. Actually, if you hold it up and look in, you can really see a lot of it at the bottom. What is that? So that's a question that I'm not really sure of, Brian. Maybe you can answer. Um, how many times or how filtered typically are stouts? Not too much at all, especially like this yeah. style. You want, them, you want it as thick as possible for these yeah. kinds. So yeah. there's not a whole much, a lot of that done. So kind of like a hazy IPA, you're just getting the uh, the unfiltered content. Yeah, no, that's like off-putting maybe to some people. It is. Yeah. It's freak uh, you out the I first was, time you see it. I was going to tell you, I was going to say the exact same thing. It's a little off-putting that there's something floating in there. I can tell you from just being around people that do brew this stuff, that that's kind of what you want. You want that. Yeah. You want that there. Little bits of goodness, extra flavor. That's right. Really? Yep. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. They they would be happy with this. I would guarantee they would not be upset that there's something in there. That there's little floaties. Yeah. There's like sticks and dirt. And, yeah. And I mean, if this was a PBR we're pouring, that's a different story. For sure. For sure. <laughs> that's a whole different story. Yeah. Did you read that story yesterday about PBR? I did. Yeah. We'll talk about that at the end because I think that's worth talking about. So. Mm -hmm. so. Let's um. Let's get into the brewery story a little bit what, okay. you, what you've done research wise and I, I give you props for your notes because they're on like some sort of digital mm. format I've just got a trying piece to, of paper trying to get into the digital age here a little bit nice. and, and uh, yeah get a little bit better with my note taking so uh, Avery Brewing Company founded in 1993 by Adam Avery uh, if you go watch the very first video on their website I love it because one he's totally irreverent he curses yeah, he, two different ones. I counted. It was yeah, great. it was awesome. It was great. Like he just doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care. Right there, there it was. Yeah. Doesn't matter. He doesn't care. He's brewing what he's doing. What he wants to do. And in what was it? Ninety two, no ninety one. Uh, he went to a Super Bowl party, and uh, the, his boss at the time was a home brewer and brought some a brown ale, and he was like, "Wow, this is really good." I. I've never had anything like this before. And his boss said, "This is I do this in my garage or whatever, and this is how I do it. And the next day, he went and bought a home brewing kit. And in 93, he opened Avery. And the, one of the quotes on there, just I, I love, I actually wrote it down for myself, and I tacked it up. Is He's like, I'm not a good employee. I don't like being told what to do. And I love that. I just I just think that's that's great. you got to be creative. And you've also probably got to have like an addiction issue. To have started a whole brewery within like two years of you know start, yep. like that that's total driven. Absolutely, like he they won their first Great American Beer Festival gold medal in '94 for their. I wrote this one down. Which one was it? It was uh, their Out of Bounds Stout. So the very yeah. first beer they won a gold medal on was a stout. So it's no surprise that yeah. you know one of their claim to fame is barrel aged stouts. Mm -hmm. um, they started barrel aging. In 2003, uh, they were the first to package slash bottle an IPA in Colorado. So they were the first packaged bottled IPA available to Colorado residents. That's cool. Which is super interesting. That's yeah. really yeah. bizarre. They I, say if they pay any homage over to Sierra Nevada on the IPA, I mean, they're kind of the founders, right? He, you know, th there's a whole story about um, his relationship with Stone, with the guy from Stone and the guy from, what's the pizza play, the pizza thing in Cal in California? Oh, in San Diego or whatever. San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, one of the guys there kept asking him for, for kegs and he finally sent one out there and it turned out to be, it was for some, it was for some festival. And so it was the first time he sent any beer out of state, and it was for that. And it turned out to be that guy. And then because of that, the dude from Stone tried it for the first time and worked out a little distribution thing there in California. And so that's why it really took off for them. Cool. So uh, their tap room opened in 2003, moved to its current location in 2005. Uh, they have 30 beers on tap at any given time. This one is still, I did check, this one is still on tap there. Um, along with a, a number of other like super limited that you can't get anyplace else. Beer nerd heaven guy. Yeah. When we went, Steve Seitner was just, he, I've never seen him so happy. Like I think the Jets could win the Super Bowl and he yeah. wouldn't be <laughs> as happy as he was when we were there. So I was very disappointed in myself for not going. You should have gone with us. You should have gone. 
it was we we really spent on having like one or two and then going on to the next one we were going to go to new belgium and a couple other places and we ended up staying there like three hours like we yeah. ate and stayed way too long jenny had to drive to our next location yeah. so it was it was it was a pretty awesome it's a trip fun spot for sure i really like that place. their tap room is amazing like if you really want it's the, it's the napa valley for craft beer yeah. right i mean and that's kind of mm-hmm. like the epicenter is is that that kind of triangle between Avery, New Belgium, uh, Odell, like right in there. And it's super dog friendly too, from what I remember. There's dogs everywhere. Everywhere. Yep. Most, most of the breweries are going to be very dog friendly. They're very much to the people, which is one one of the things I like about beer. Because let's face it, since the beginning of time, what's brought people together more than anything out there mm-hmm. besides beer? Beer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you count wine and you know that type mm-hmm. of thing, but it's all the same, right? I mean, yeah. it's just. It's all the same, just different socioeconomic backgrounds and yep. different genres and groups that yep. come together over it. Right. So Tap Room is open Monday from 3 to 10, Tuesday through Sunday, 11.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. Brewery tours, and I would highly suggest this because the guy that does the tour is amazing. There's a couple guys, but the one guy that we always get, and I've done it a couple times, is amazing. Uh, Monday through Friday, they do one at 4 o'clock. On Saturdays, they do two of them, uh, two, uh, one at 2 o'clock and one at 3.30 and then Sunday they have one at two o'clock. So, um, I if you are anywhere near Boulder, Colorado, I, I think this is definitely one that you should you should try. For sure. Yeah. Road trip. Let's go. Road trip. I, I would yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're gonna so, hit breweries on the way. Make that our kind of our mm-hmm. grand marshal of stops and as we cross the state, so we could start at Cross Drain, mm-hmm. and then as we cross the state, we could we could stop at Boiler in. Uh, in Lincoln, maybe zip line, and then Kincader as we get to Broken Bow, and then I think we'd be getting a hotel in Lincoln. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're probably making yeah, it's right. probably like a ten day road trip. Right, yeah, we could gonna, take like Uber a, trip, a beer with Atlas on the road. That's a see. Now you're mm-hmm. thinking. That's that's thinking right there. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. So I did some uh, research into truffles oh. today because that's like you know we've we've talked mm-hmm. about stouts and all that sort of stuff. So I was. That's, that's basically what this is a play on, mm-hmm. right? So it's a chocolate truffle. So I, w- I wanted to look that up. And I also looked up the actual truffles themselves because those are expensive. That was like all I knew about them was that they're expensive. Expensive, yeah. So what I found out was um, most of them come, especially the there's basically black and white are the two different kinds that there are. Mm-hmm. And they basically come from like Italy, France, and that area. And then also there's some in... Um, Australia, New Zealand. That seems to be where the majority of these come from. And back in the day, um, pigs were used to find them, mm-hmm. but then the pigs would eat most of them because mushrooms are like their favorite thing. Mm-hmm. So the people that owned the pigs were not getting any of the truffles. So now they started training dogs to do it because dogs apparently don't like mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they use them. They're, they usually grow under, I found out, oak and hazel trees, hazelnut trees. Okay. And that's where you're usually going to find them. Um, the price for them, a white truffle, is three thousand dollars a pound. What? And the black one is thirty dollars for two ounces. So you can buy that on Amazon wow. right now, but the white one's not so much. And the record was like somebody paid like thirty six hundred dollars for one truffle because it was like a pound and a half, almost two pound truffle. Some guy in Japan. Wow. Paid for that. So I've heard of this insane want for truffles and people paying but i've never heard of those kind of figures for a truffle wow i guess from what i've seen it's basically just like um you shave it real thin and you just put it on the top of what you're making like it's not an ingredient you would cook it in you just like put it on the top like shredded cheese or something okay it's not to be like um covered up or muddled with anything else it's like the the main thing that you're trying the very first bite of your meal if you're having these things so does it have a, like a mushroomy pungent taste they call it um you've heard this term before probably umami mm-hmm. so very earthy mm-hmm. yes and they also found out that that means it doesn't need any salt to make it taste good so oh. if you don't have to add anything else to it mm-hmm. then that's what the definition of that comes from huh. the other side of the coin is truffles chocolate truffles they were made to look like truffles okay on purpose um, the first one I could find, 1895, in France. Dude named Louis Defour hmm. made them for Christmas. So you're talking about Christmas candies, right? Right. So he made them 
on on purpose. He was trying to come up with something a little bit different to sell in his in his shop. And basically, it's chocolate ganache that is created with hot cream that they've like basically boiled, pour over some chocolate, mm-hmm. let it cool down, form it into lumps um, because truffle is Latin for lump. Okay. And then once it's cooled off enough and it's formed, and they put cocoa powder on it, so that when you touch it, you're not instantly melting the chocolate right with your skin and your mm-hmm. hands. So that's basically what that is, mm-hmm. and I think that's their play on the on that on the truffle. And that's why it's called that. So that's that's what I know about truffles today. Oh, that's interesting. I gotta tell you, mm-hmm. it's it was not this uh, lumpy at the <laughs> at the. This is like when you get coffee grounds at the bottom of your uh, at the on the bottom of your coffee, mm-hmm. yeah, kind of thing. So this is desirable. You're saying like this this is a thing. Yeah, it's the people absolutely. Will what? Not be, yeah, really. For, yep. And me from a kid. I mean, I, I ate coffee grounds as a kid, and so I get coffee grounds in the bottom of my coffee even nowadays. Yeah. I enjoy that, and you what? get into your IPAs, you get those really hazy, unfiltered IPAs. For sure. I'll send you some really cool pictures of ones that we've held up to the light, and you can just see all the floaties the through floaties. it. It's like a snow globe. Yeah, a really good does. one. I've seen yeah. I had a Todd the Axe Man one like that, mm-hmm. and then it was like a um, Clown Shoes Guava King or something that I poured into a glass. Yeah. And then when the first time I saw it, I was like, what is this? And somebody had to tell me, like, mm-hmm. no, that's good. You want that in there. What? Like, that goes against everything I know. I wish I'd I, – I, wow. This, okay. Okay. The other thing about this is as it's kind of sticking to the side, that means that your glass is clean. Oh. So this is also because I washed these last week, so I did, did a good job. Yeah, so you did. Just plug in that. Mm. All right. That's a very good job, Brian. Well, I, floaties otherwise, I, I just this is probably one of my favorite stouts of all time. If Again, if you are anywhere close to Boulder, Colorado, Avery Brewing Company is worth checking out, and not just for the stouts. They have a ton of other beers that are – Unbelievable! From their White Rascal, which is a uh, which is a, a Belgian wit, which is probably one of the easiest drinking Belgian wits I've ever had. Mm-hmm. Uh, to they have a really really good one, who and its name is horribly hard to pronounce. Little Lily Capolo. Oh yeah, I know which one you're talking about. It's a it, it is it's it's a take on a Hawaiian uh, with with. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, pineapple and and you know that type of thing. You're pouring something else here, and I don't, I I don't know what's I'm going waiting on. For you to get done with yours, I gotta chew up this last little yeah. bit here. Let me shake it up and see. Let's see. Anyway, so that's that's my take on Avery Brewing Company. Yeah. Cannot cannot recommend it highly enough. And you can find them on Beer Advocate pretty regularly. Um, most of their beers are on there. Even the the retired beers will, they'll, and they'll give you a pretty good rating across the board. And Avery typically rates pretty well. Yes, they have. Besides this one, they have some. of just great stouts. It was like Uncle Jacob's is one, mm, and that yeah. Nutty Professor one that's really good. Mm-hmm. Peanut butter stout. Mm-hmm. Can't go wrong. Yeah. All so right. So this we... one, what we're getting today, this is a homebrew. Oh. So this is, I, I wanted to bring something today that I've had a part in. Okay. Uh, and it was also a stout, and it's going to be a little bit, not as, well, it's going to definitely not be as sweet as what we just mm-hmm. had, but it'll still be a little bit on that side. So bonus coverage, we're getting a homebrew. Yeah, we're going to get a, a stout that's... Stout. That that I've uh, helped make. Huh. All right. So, the backstory of this one, and one of the things I wanted to research really, is a term that I've been seeing more and more. Like if you read stories or articles or you're on Untapped, uh, is the term adjunct. Adjunct. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, I had to look that up a little bit just to make sure I knew what it was talking about. Uh, and the definition is something that's joined or added to another thing, but not necessarily a part of it. Huh. Does this make you a professor? An adjunct mm, professor. Adjunct. It makes so much more sense now. I looked that up too. Yes. And that's true because those people are not on the tenure track at a university. So they're not in line to get uh-huh. tenure. Oh. So they're an adjunct professor, and that is majority of educators in the university or college system nowadays are adjunct professors. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. All right. So this How is does, a stout. Yeah. Um, it's We barrel aged it. It's got chocolate, it's got coffee, and it's got uh, Madagascar vanilla beans, which are super expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we made it um, in a 10-gallon batch. Okay. I think it was about maybe about 250 bucks for everything by the time we made it. it was We got about nine and a half gallons out of what we started with. Where'd so, you get a barrel from? Um, you can buy them online. Oh, okay. They sell them for home brewers. Um, they're smaller. It's like a five-gallon barrel. 
um, you can get you can pay more for big ones for sure but uh, for somebody who's just doing it at home five gallons is about as much as you want to do so I gotta tell you I like that a lot that's interesting you get every bit of the chocolate mm -hmm. and then vanilla like it's weird how the flavors kind of mm -hmm. how the flavors are staggered almost yeah and this is probably warmer almost than we'd really want it to be okay but we'll, we'll do what we can no I think it's fine um, so the adjunct part of this thing, and this is an adjunct beer, um, because we used it, we use this as a base beer for other beers. Okay. So we brewed out just an Imperial stout. Okay. And then when you start adding things to it, it becomes an adjunct beer. Okay. Because it wasn't necessary to make the, the first thing. It wasn't the part that you needed to create the actual drink itself. Mm -hmm. Then you start, um, siphoning off or keeping out, um, different amounts to do different things with. So we did one where it was the same thing as this, but we added cinnamon to it as well. Mm. Um, we had one that we did some like ancho chilies, mm. um, or I think maybe it was might even been ghost pepper, but stuff like oh. that. So interesting. Um, a lot of times home brewers and other, and other places like even cross train, I know does this, they'll make a big batch mm -hmm. and they'll keep out some of it, a percentage, 20%, 10% or whatever. And they mess with that and do what they want to do with that super limited stuff. Yep. And then, They've, they've basically just taken the base beer and changed it by just a little bit. Things that will add chocolate, fruit or vegetables, extra grain or different grains. Um, instead of barley, they'll put, you know, wheat, like when you get to like a Hefeweizen or something like that. Mm -hmm. Herbs and spices, not KFC style, but like when we're talking about <laughs> um, uh, coriander or yep. saffron, those mm -hmm. sort of things. Um, and then extra sugar is what usually a lot of times you'll see, and sometimes mm -hmm. even brown sugar to pump up that ABV to oh the, oh because the extra the yeast will eat the brown mm -hmm. sugar then that makes sense and then the last one is bacteria okay so when we're drinking our sours and stuff you're not right. normally thinking of it's additive but it is it's mm -hmm. something that was put into the beer afterwards that didn't need to be there right to change the the flavor at the end so that's basically what an adjunct beer is if you see that term interesting so it, it makes perfect sense why you would why you would bring this in mm -hmm. the, the the barrel age with the barrel age. I'll tell you, and this is this is for every beer rookie out there that is listening. That I know you, that, you know, you're thinking the same thing I am, or was. No way, I'm drinking this, right? Yeah. I'm not. There's, I don't, I don't like things that taste like wood. I don't think it tastes yeah. like coffee. Yeah, or just are so dark they're scary looking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, this looks like motor oil. I don't. I know I'm not going to like this or whatever. You have to ease your way into it and give it a shot, and the. The a Avery has a lot of gateway ones that are, especially with this one, this, you know, it's just starting off, that you could really ease your way into. And then you get more into something like you've done here, right? That's, yeah. you know, for sure. I think, like you said, their first one was Out of Bounds or whatever, the stout that won the. Yep, yep. I mean, that's, so they got some success and it was popular mm -hmm. and they wanted to push the envelope and that's the way they do it. And we started way back when, started talking about breweries like, Get to really show off their tricks with stouts and yes. IPAs, mm -hmm. and this is the time of year for for stouts. So that's that's yep. kind of what we're doing today. Speaking of which, there is a really really fun uh, video where Adam Avery talks about their Hog Heaven. Is it mm -hmm. Hog Heaven? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, where it turned out like it was a it was technically a double IPA. They didn't know what to call it, um, but it was a super high alcohol ABV and. Uh, so they called it a barley wine. It yeah. was their take on barley wine or whatever, and that took off for them. Like it was the first one that really, really took off. Mm. So, and they still sell it now. It's yeah, still, it's, it's still a. I can't say as I've ever had it. I will definitely try it now. And my next trip to Colorado, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. Nice. So look at you, all this growth. <sighs> yes, man. <laughs> In the beer world. I know. The guy goes from liking Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah. To I was sours, really a, I to was a IPAs. vodka guy first, though. I mean, that was my yeah. thing. Is I liked vodka drinks. That was my jam. And then I couldn't even. Well, I mean, it was Bobby and Scott really that got me. That really changed things. Yeah. So I think for me, it kind of started out in the stout world before I ever liked IPAs. But that goes back to the childhood thing I was saying about liking coffee grounds as a kid. Mm -hmm. My grandparents would literally let me eat them out of the can. Whoa. I know Whoa. it sounds terrible, but that's just kind of something that. Later in life, started with the Bud Light and then went to Coors Light mm. from Rodney Carrington, a country comedian that we used to kind of be friends with before he became famous. Mm -hmm. 
And then once I get into crafts, that really started with the the heavies, that more coffee tasting, yep. darker, heavier beers. Do you like coffee? Love coffee. Okay. Because that was a thing yeah. for me. Like Seitner would years for years, he would say like, I, cause I love coffee. He's like, you need to be drinking this like mm-hmm. this. You would like this. I don't think I would. Yeah. Sure enough. Well, even with coffee fans, a lot, you know, a lot of times it's bitterness, you know, or right. Like mm-hmm. a super strong black coffee or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're basically there on some of the flavor profiles of beer. Yeah, so absolutely. That su- doesn't surprise me that you like IPAs yeah. and stouts, you know, right. Here you say that. So Mike, talk about a little bit. I mean, you're here because you're the client manager for Colorado. Um, talk about hospitals that we have out there, seasonal needs, or just needs in general. Yeah, so Colorado is really, it's a, it's a four-season state as far as needs go. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, there's no season where the needs are any higher or really any lower. Um, unless you see a big baby boom, you might see an L&D increase. You're going to see that in any state. Um, there's no time of year people do not want to be in Colorado. Um, some of the issues with it now are housing. Mm-hmm. With recent bills that have passed, um, housing prices have gone up considerably. Yeah, but overall, across the board, every month of the year is a pretty consistent month in Colorado for nurses wanting to be there. Lots to do. I mean, mm-hmm. the winter time there's the skiing, snowboarding, horseshoeing, you know, cross country snowmobiling. You know, you get your spring, your summer. You've got the hiking. You've got fishing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always hunting. I mean, there's just something for everybody at all times. Right. Trail riding, biking, and so on. I mean, there's just never a lack of things to do. Colorado's kind of a passion fruit of mine, a place that I dream to retire in. Um, I used to be a snowboard instructor, so Mm. I've spent many, many, many years, months in Colorado. Yeah. um, Traveling out there back and forth, whatever the case. There, there is a lot of opportunity in Colorado. Just, I mean, outside of, of travel nursing, that's yeah. it's a state that is really exploding right now. It's like a big tech boom in Denver and stuff, right? Yes, downtown, yeah, yeah. New, new hot thing, and downtown Denver is 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 really, really transforming. Yep. Yeah. Twenty twenty years ago, I was looking at moving to Denver. This ages me a bit, but mm-hmm. um, when I was looking at moving in there, a couple of stats that really popped into mind to me was uh, 5,000 new residents every month with nobody leaving. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the wow. property values had gone up 60% in less than five years. That's amazing. That's yeah. unbelievable. If you could have bought property 25 years ago in and around the Denver area and now really anywhere in Colorado, mm-hmm. uh, you would stand to make make a mint on it you absolutely. could retire to colorado you, you could absolutely retire to could yeah. so with that said that's going to make my dream a little more difficult now <laughs> just knowing what properties are going that's for we need nurses to go to colorado there so we might go. retire yeah absolutely so talk in relation to all of that then bill rates in colorado at least when i was when i was doing what you're doing mm-hmm. right bill rates in colorado were pretty bad still the case okay but when I mean, you're still a destination state it's not a right and it's their a, needs open. And it's a heavy destination state. And this right. goes back to what I was speaking of before. You can go to certain areas of the country. They'll have summer rates, winter rates. Mm-hmm. With Colorado being a destination state year-round 365, the rates really stay. I've challenged my vendors a little bit on this mm-hmm. and said, how do you expect somebody to make a living on X rate? Sure. The response I get 10 out of 10 times is if your nurse can't make this rate happen, I've got a stack of 50 that will right. and are ready to do it because that's what the area demands. That's what they. That's where mm-hmm. people want to be. And right. so until that demand shrinks, we have no reason to raise our rates. It's no different than Hawaii. Hawaii is the Hawaii exact is same way. Exact same way. Yeah. And, and it's kind of an anomaly state because, like I said, anywhere else you go, you go to California. California has the same to offer 24-7 as Colorado, 365. Mm-hmm. However, you get a difference in the rates out there of a summer rate and a winter rate. Right. And Colorado, uh, the hospitals as a whole just haven't felt the need to provide that. Yeah. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I'll tell you now, I've been into the majority of the hospitals. When you were on the floor, mm-hmm. the views alone that you see even while you're at work mm-hmm. would be worth worth the price of admission. Sure. I sat on the fifth floor of Littleton on an ICU. Mm-hmm. I believe it was the fifth floor. I'd have to go back and mm-hmm. remember. It was fifth or sixth floor. Anyways, I'm on the ICU looking out, and all you see is just mountain views for days. Yeah. It was beautiful, gorgeous. You see some snow cap on the tops, and this is in June. 
So, so my brother lives probably, gosh, I don't know, 10 minutes from that hospital right there. Yeah. And he, so he lived in, we, we grew up in Kansas. He moved to Omaha for a while. Moved to Colorado, oh gosh, maybe 12, 13 years ago. He's never mm-hmm. coming back. <laughs> no. Never. He's, it's, he's there forever. So, I mean, he's a, he's, he is a Colorado resident now for life. Can't say as if I blame him, and no. don't don't be surprised if at some day I come to you and say, "Hey, moving to Colorado, moving we'll be Colorado. remote. Let's <laughs> go from home. <laughs> I'm working from Rich's place." <laughs> awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, I appreciate you. it. Uh, dropping some knowledge on Colorado hospitals. Uh, if you have any interest in going to Colorado at all, work through your recruiter. Mike will be the guy that submits your profile from your recruiter. Um, and he's always available. You can call him too. He's, yeah, uh, you absolutely can. Um, I, I love speaking with nurses. I love hearing about different backgrounds and just different needs and ideas. And I'm always available to answer questions, whether I'm answering questions to you or to your recruiter. Um, ask any and all questions up front. Perfect. All right. And Brian, like usual, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rich. I love the uh, the, the lesson on barrel age today. That's, uh, yeah, it was that's, fun. A, that's a lot of fun. So. We are going to do a couple more Christmassy themed uh, beers. Hopefully, if I can get my hands on some local Christmas beers, that would be great. Mm, yeah. We'll see. I don't know. We'll. Uh, we've got a couple weeks here between now and Christmas to to talk about beers. We may double up on some of them. You never know. Um, There's but, a lot of Christmassy flavors to mm-hmm. get to with you know not enough time. So Absolutely, we might, we might just have to take one for the team and drink two or three. We would totally do that. We would do that if Dolan were here. He today, would have already have had three. He would have had three already. Yeah, you're, right. you're absolutely right. I will, so. I will donate a Prairie Christmas bomb to Ooh, the uh, occasion. Uh-oh. There we go. There we go. See Prairie out of Oklahoma. Yep. Yeah, Oklahoma City, right? Right, right out, right outside of Tulsa, I believe. Right. Oh, there, you go. there we go. He, he just got another invitation. That's right. Come on back. Mike will be back in a couple weeks to... Uh, <laughs> to drink the fairy Christmas bomb. I love it. So. Like these guys, I'm a beer aficionado. I, I love the different beers. I will come back anytime you invite me. We do a lot down in Oklahoma, too, so that would yeah, be... absolutely. Be I think, Brian, you want you pick next week's, right? Are we doing the Shiner Christmas? Yeah, we're going to do that because i got a different, little bit different way to do that one. So we're going to do Shiner Christmas cheer. All right. Holiday cheer, I think it's called. So tune in next week's Shiner Christmas cheer, number two in our uh, Christmas series. We'll see you next week.